This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehia Suhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... I strongly believe that the creativity and ingenuity of Africa's young leaders will help us shape the future of the world. That's U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris addressing the African and Diaspora Young Leaders Forum yesterday at the African-U.S. Leaders Summit. Details coming up also. South African President's future remains uncertain. Somalia and Ethiopia top a watch list of countries most likely to face worsening crisis next year. And Morocco plays France with a place in the World Cup final at stake. We'll have these stories and more on African News Tonight. We start with our top story. Nearly 50 leaders from Africa are in Washington for the U.S.-Africa Summit that began yesterday with a special focus on youth leadership, entrepreneurship, peace and security. VOA's Peter Clote spoke with Lesotho's Prime Minister, Sam Matakane, who stressed the importance of trade in AGOA, the U.S.-Africa Growth and Opportunity Act that aims to boost trade between African nations and the U.S. Look, uh, AGOA has been very, very, very helpful to our country and to our nation as well. Because uh, I think that is from 1967 when Nagoa started in Lesotho. Uh, there's a lot of factories that have been built, which has given a uh, lot of jobs to our people. And uh, they have just been uh, working on the factories and uh, improving their lives. Uh, because, I mean, what was happening uh, is that uh, they, were, they would do the stuff in the factories and export it to the U.S. Uh, we have just negotiated this morning uh, with the senators uh, that we need to extend AGOA by 10 years because it's coming to an end in 2025. So we have already started negotiations in that part. AGOA is very, very, very important to us as a country. Also yesterday, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris began the summit by attending the African and Diaspora Young Leaders Forum. I strongly believe that the creativity and ingenuity of Africa's young leaders will help us shape the future of the world and that their ideas, your ideas, and innovations and initiatives will benefit the entire world. The Biden-Harris administration intends to be right there alongside you, these young leaders, knowing it is the spark and determination of young people that will drive and move us forward. And we are particularly excited about this future. The vice president announced the administration would invest an additional $100 million to expand the Young African Leaders Initiative and said the U.S. Export-Import Bank was entering new memorandums of understanding to lead to $1 billion in new commercial financing in Africa. Late US, later, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke at a forum to discuss peace, governance, and security with the presidents of Niger, Mozambique, and Somalia, and the chairperson of the African Union Commission. There's no one model of good governance. There's no one model for how to build strong institutions. I think we have to be informed by each other. We have to be informed by uh, local uh, conditions, local, local needs. And from the perspective of the United States, uh, this is also not about a competition with others. This is not about saying uh, to our friends and partners, uh, you have to choose. This is about offering a genuine choice, uh, offering a genuine partnership. Today, the summit events focus on advancing trade and investment partnerships that bolster Africa's role in the global economy. For more on the summit, check out VOAAfrica.com and stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs. 
U.S. President Joe Biden hopes to boost trade opportunities for American businesses and investors while also building trust with African leaders during his three-day U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, which kicked off yesterday. Forty-nine African heads of state and leaders, as well as the African Union, were invited. As former U.S. Ambassador to Senegal and the Gambia and member of the National Security Council, retired diplomat Herman Cohen has decades of experience in Africa. Cohen, who advises African governments on strategic planning as president of the Cohen and Woods International, disagrees with experts who say the U.S. has taken a back seat to Russia and China in influence on the continent. What do they have to offer Africa? They have nothing to offer on economic development, which is what Africa needs. What Russia has given is in areas of conflict, like the Sahel, or in uh, Somalia, for example, they are offering mercenaries who who take a lot of money uh, from these countries. So I I don't see Russia influence as being so great. Uh, For example, in Central African Republic, uh, which has had a civil war, they sent in mercenaries, uh, so-called Wagner Group, and the Wagner Group is now taking control of Central African Republic diamonds. And Central African Republic has some of the best jewelry diamonds in the world, and the Russian mercenaries are not controlling it. I don't see that as Russian influence. I think this is Russian uh, destructive influence. Well, why does Russia then have that kind of influence? What are they giving these countries? Well, in civil wars, of which there are several in Africa, especially in the Sahel, they provide mercenaries. Look, we will we will get rid of the enemy. Uh, The government is facing a civil war. We will take care of these rebels. In return, we want a lot of money. So some African countries have no choice. It's it's the Russian mercenaries or nothing. What kinds of deals will trade ministers meeting with U.S. lawmakers try to work out? Yes, well, I think uh, we're going to ask for reciprocity. There is the African Growth and Opportunities Act, where the Africans can send any products that they manufacture to the United States duty-free. I think we're going to try to get reciprocity. Uh, The European countries' exports to Africa come in duty-free. So we want our exports to Africa to come in duty-free. I think we will put a lot of pressure on the African trade ministers uh, and the heads of state to give us this uh, equal opportunity. What about on the political side? Many African countries, you know, have been ruled by autocratic leaders for years and years with rampant corruption as a byproduct of that. Will U.S. officials bring that up, this touchy subject, with their African counterparts at the summit? I think they have to do that because what what does corruption do, basically? It takes a large percentage of the revenue that the government, that the country earns, say, from mining or from agriculture, and it turns it into, gives it to private pockets. So the United States has to raise that. I attended that first U.S.-Africa Leader Summit hosted by President Obama eight years ago, the biggest international gathering in Washington since before the pandemic. And as you know, dozens and dozens of African heads of states and leaders were here. How does that summit compare with this one in terms of attendance and where the U.S. influence stands with Africa as compared to that of China and Russia? I think uh, President Obama's summit was uh, was very well attended, and I think uh, the last day uh, there was a very strong U.S. business presence there, and I think there were a lot of a lot of relationships were developed, and, and I think it resulted in increased U.S. investment in, in certain African countries. Are there certain natural resources and other things that are being mined from certain African countries that the U.S. is particularly interested in? Yes, we're very interested now in renewable energy, and renewable energy requires batteries. The sun doesn't doesn't uh, shine at night, and the wind doesn't always blow. So you have to take that energy as created and put it into batteries, so you can store it for use at night and, and when there's no wind. And Africa has very important elements that go into batteries. For example, cobalt. Also, there's lithium. Africa has has significant amounts of lithium. We want to make sure that these products are available and and we're investing in them. That's uh, Ambassador Herman Cohen, president of Cohen & Woods International. He was speaking with VOA's Carol Van Dam. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America.
As expected, South Africa's governing African National Congress, the ANC, yesterday used its majority in Parliament to prevent an impeachment inquiry into the conduct of President Cyril Ramaphosa. This after a legal panel, which included judges, found he could have committed crime and acted unconstitutionally in connection with the theft of almost $600,000 from his ranch in early 2020. But as Darren Taylor reports, Ramaphosa's future remains uncertain. Ramaphosa says the money was from sales of buffalo to a Sudanese businessman who's confirmed this. This in itself is a violation of the Constitution, which prohibits a sitting president from doing private business. Evidence also suggests Ramaphosa covered up the robbery at his Palapala ranch because of this and because he hadn't declared the cash to tax authorities. Instead, according to allegations, he used bodyguards to find the robbers, torture them, retrieve the money and pay them for their silence. The president denies the claims and is disputing the panel's findings in court. Even though Ramaphosa isn't going to be impeached, analysts say yesterday's vote has weakened him. In an unprecedented move, four senior party officials, including former President Jacob Zuma and ANC leadership candidate Nkosazana Zuma, voted to impeach Ramaphosa. Others didn't turn up to vote. The leader of major opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, John Stiernazen, says Ramaphosa cannot hide forever. We'll be calling for the creation of an ad hoc committee with far wider powers than the Section 89 independent panel had to be able to summon and subpoena, to be able to go beyond the scope of just the papers. Um, let's be able to call the president and call uh, Wally Ruder and Such a committee would call witnesses, including Ramaphosa's bodyguards, the tax revenue service, and even the alleged robbers. We can't move on with this left hanging in the air now, with us still today no wiser about why the money was there, what it was intended for, why it was covered up for two years, why it wasn't reported to a police station, and what the president was ultimately hoping to achieve by all of this. Stiernazen is convinced the president's application for the Constitutional Court to set aside the panel's findings against him will fail. Parliament's going to find itself in a very difficult position now if the public protector and that Constitutional Court's judgment does not go in the president's favour. What does Parliament then do after having just prematurely thrown out an independent panel report that it itself commissioned? Political analyst for the Brenthurst Foundation, Dr. Greg Mills, says millions of citizens who praised Ramaphosa for his anti-corruption reforms have lost faith in him. There's a conspiracy of optimism about President Ramaphosa always, and that to a certain extent is true for the ANC, that there's a good ANC and it's better than no ANC. He says the so-called Farmgate scandal calls Ramaphosa's integrity into question severely. More important than that is whether President Ramaphosa will, presuming he gets re-elected at the ANC Congress, change his ways, whether he will stand up and out as a leader of note and accelerate the reform process to enable the good to happen. Otherwise, we bumble along with an oligarchy making money, extracting rents, and perhaps even descending into an ugly scenario. At its elective conference this weekend, the ANC will choose a leader. Ramaphosa faces opposition from Nkosazana Zuma and a man he fired for alleged corruption, former health minister Zueli Mkize. Most analysts expect Ramaphosa to win re-election. But police investigations into the farm robbery continue. Should criminal charges result, Ramaphosa would be compelled to step aside as ANC leader and as president. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Meta Platforms, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, is being sued for allowing posts that allegedly inflamed Ethiopia's civil war. The lawsuit was filed by two African researchers and Kenya's Katiba Institute Rights Group. Reuters says they allege that Facebook's recommendation systems amplified 
violent posts. One plaintiff is the son of an Ethiopian academic whose address was publicized on the site before he was killed. The other has moved to Kenya for fear of his life after a barrage of hateful posts for his work exposing human rights violations in Ethiopia. A lawyer for the plaintiff says the company prioritizes violent messages and makes money from the content. It also says Meta fails to identify dangerous messages and lacks a trained staff to police violent material. The French news agency AFP says the petitioners are asking Kenya's high court to establish a $1.6 billion fund for victims of hate and violence incited by Facebook. Meta says hate speech and incitement of violence go against the policies of Facebook and Instagram. In Qatar and all across Africa and the Arab world, excitement is building as Morocco's Atlas Lions get ready to face off with France, the 2018 champions in the World Cup semifinals. The Moroccans have defeated three other European opponents, Portugal, Spain and Belgium, and drawn 0-0 with fellow semifinalist Croatia on their way to becoming the first African team in history to reach the last four. VOA Sunny Young has a preview of the history-making matchup. I'm sure the Moroccans will be closely marking French star Kylian Mbappe, who leads all scores with five goals at this first World Cup held in the Middle East. Brazilian great Ronaldo scored 15 World Cup goals during his career, and he praises Mbappe's skills. I was talking about how fast he is and how good he is and how he's remember me when I played before so and he's uh, he knows how to use his ability you know how 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 to go faster than the others and uh, uh, use that ability to assist or score so I think uh, France is the favorite one to win the World Cup as I thought before the World Cup starts and Mbappé, for me, is going to be the best player for the World Cup. For a deeper look at today's match, which kicks off at 1900 UTC, reporter Mike Imboni spoke with Fessio Dairo, the chief football writer of www.aclsports.com. Dairo spoke with from Doha, Qatar, where he is covering the action. I expect another good game of football when France and Morocco come toe-to-toe at the Albaid Stadium in al here in Qatar on Wednesday night. It's going to be a historic game with a lot of records and greatness on ground to achieve by either side. France will be bidding to become first nation to play in consecutive World Cup finals ever since Brazil played in three back-to-back from 1994 to 2002. Well, for the Moroccans, we know they've surpassed expectations already. They've, they've become the first African team to reach this stage and they will surely be aspiring to take it a notch higher with a win against the Europeans. So definitely, I expect... A competitive game, I expect a passionate one. Um, I do hope we do not have controversies like we saw in some games in the quarterfinal, but we expect the best of football in our history. Majority of the Moroccan players ply their trade in Europe. That's up to 90% of them. The entire France, French squad also have their squad based in Europe. So it could be uh, coming together of two sets of players playing in Europe but with different ideologies because the Moroccans will be hoisting the flag of Africa and the Arab world right there in front of uh, over 50,000 fans at the Albaid Stadium. Morocco has surprised football analysts and indeed the world with their games so far. Do you think the victory run will continue? It is definitely going to be a difficult game for Morocco. Yes, all their games here in Qatar have been difficult and they've managed to come out on scathe on each occasion. Here they've played four top European countries from Croatia to Belgium to Spain to Portugal and now here comes France, another giant. But 
they definitely know that the higher they go, the tougher the battle becomes. And so I won't bet against them doing the business again at the Albite Stadium. Yes, injuries are now setting, the stakes are now higher because every opposition now know them and know what they are capable of. But you can't, you can't bet against them doing it once again. I think that they have all it takes to continue their amazing run. They've only considered one goal in all their matches, which is a very good factor to leverage on. If you don't consider a goal in a football game, then you have a good chance of winning it. So, if they've stopped the biggest stars of this world, the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, the likes of Alvaro Morata, to Kevin De Bruyne, and, and even the Croats from scoring, then they can do so for the likes of Olivier Giroud and Kylian Mbappe of France. I am totally backing them to go all the way. Uh, but even if they don't, they will surely be proud of what they have done so far. Fisayo, a win or defeat for Morocco in the semi-final game remains a record. What do you think the Moroccan team will be remembered for after the World Cup? The Atlas Lions of Morocco's class of 2022 will forever be remembered as the trailblazing set that held the old footballing world spellbound with their results and achievements here in Qatar 2022. Not only have they reached heights unimaginable, or not only have they achieved the previously unachievable by any African team or Arab team, but the manner with which they have done that will forever be registered on the record books. Here in Qatar, at this stage, they are the team with the least amount of goals conceded. They are the teams that have been so difficult to break down. They are the team who are yet to concede a goal from an opposition. And they are the team who have united the whole of Africa and the Arab world. Sometimes ago on the Sunny Side of Sport, I talked about even the unity in that team. And this has permeated through the team, onto the pitch, and onto the whole of Africa. So this set will definitely be remembered as a team we emerged from a very difficult group to make themselves one of the most difficult teams to, be, to, to play against. And this will linger for long in the heart of many African football followers and especially if they could go the extra mile and achieve the unthinkable but even if they don't they've done enough to make sure to ensure that these things they've achieved in Qatar remain indelible in the hearts of all footballing fans across the globe. That was Fasio Dairo, the chief football writer at www.aclsports.com. He spoke to reporter Mike Mbonye from Qatar. Morocco is the first team from the African continent and the first team from the Arab-speaking nation to make the semifinals. Catch up on the latest world news on voaafrica.com slash World Cup. And don't forget to look for our latest World Cup podcast on goal with Sonny and Milk Beal. We'll have an update on today's action on African News Tonight at 1800 UTC with Sonny Young. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib.